guess we'll make it casual. What was, what was your overall take from it? Well, I, first, let's kind of establish where you are as a shooter. Okay, well, I, uh, I'm a relatively recent enthusiast in getting firearms, shooting firearms, getting familiar with firearms. I've had no formal training at all. Uh, and really was looking forward to going and go through and going through a structured instruction process and basically be there with a group of people who are also sort of on their own journey at different levels. So I didn't feel any pressure about having to have ha achieved a certain level of uh, proficiency. Uh, and I, I wanted to go to Front Sight to basically see what this place was a lot of people had talked about uh, and have a chance to try out a firearm that I don't own and uh, see how my relatively novice skills might apply. You did very well by the way with a firearm that you didn't own. Yeah. You did very well period. It was, well, it, was a, it was really interesting to go there and I mean, they make you go through uh, some lectures that you think, oh, all I want to do is go and shoot, but the lectures make you have to think about things that a responsible gun, gun owner should be forced to think about. Uh, and uh, some things about planning, about your family and what situations you think you would draw, and you really need to think through those kinds of things, the liabilities, it's not just a matter of knowing the laws, uh, I thought it was just really helpful to get pushed through things, whether it's a range of situational awareness to the liability questions, and then getting back on to the range and just step by step of very basic things building sort of line upon line till you get to the point where I, my proficiency as a shooter definitely improved even just after two days of trying things based on their methodology. And in how many rounds? Well, that's interesting too because the, I, did, I did a rental program with Front Sight, which makes it very easy for people if they're traveling by air to or from and they don't want to try to figure out the TSA process, or if, like me, they just wanted to try a different firearm. Uh, you go and they will only allow you to buy ammo from their supplier on site if you're using their rental gun and each course has a prescribed quantity of ammo. For the two-day uh, handgun class, it was 200 rounds. And when we were getting pretty much into the second day, I started to worry that we were gonna run out. It ended up they were pretty close to the 200 round count and maybe a little under. Uh, but if, if needed, they did allow me to buy an extra 50 to uh, get through the class, and I still have all 50 of those rounds coming home with me. So within that 200 round count, about uh, you saw improvement in your marksmanship. No question in my mind. Just the comfort, the comfort, proper ways of thinking about trigger pull. Uh, they introduced a grip that I had some elements of familiarity with, but definitely not mastery of. Uh, but just the talking through the right sight picture, sight alignment. Uh, and to the proper grip and the proper trigger pull, just going through some of those basic mechanics with real instructors in a real training environment made a marked difference in my marksmanship in a short period of time. And now it's just up to me to practice it. That's, uh, and, and for me, I've been shooting since I was a kid. And, uh, so with all those years experience, within that 200 rounds, myself, I found too that I had increased marksmanship having taken that course. That was fun to see. Yeah, and you know, we also, you know, you go to a class like this too, there is a modest entertainment value in the selection of humanity that's in the class with you. <laughs> uh, you know, in a way, it's sort of heartening that there is this wide sampling of different people in different parts of life, couples that bicker with each other on the course. We have some stories. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there were some young people, there are people of different ethnic backgrounds, there are people from different geographies. Uh, and the instructors really were, number one, they paid a lot of attention to the people that were of greatest danger to themselves and everyone else, which was appropriate. Yes. Uh, but 
there there were people that seemed like they might be firing their first shot in life yeah. on that range, and there were people who were repeat customers that had taken that same course before, and maybe were bringing another family member with them, and uh, so it was it was it was a really interesting experience. And like we noticed when we left, it's also interesting how in two days of open carrying, you find it unusual to go out in public and nobody's open carrying. <laughs> we went out to a, a restaurant afterwards and uh, we were looking around and that's one thing I was like, why do these people not have guns on their hips? What's wrong with this? Because everyone there has guns. And there was about, I would say, 400 to 500 people there. At least. And the, the class size was, uh, I, I thought was well managed. It wasn't huge, it wasn't small, but they did spend a little more time on those that needed it, uh, mainly for safety reasons. Yeah, well, I mean, I think people who consider themselves interested in guns uh, and really feel like they, they should get greater awareness of the firearm, get some foundational training, and to me, I just thought that that added level of making you think about how your life is different when armed is important. Uh, and th there's a lot of talk about that when you get into talking with friends and you start uh, taking in social media and magazine subscriptions and other kinds of things about gun ownership. Uh, but there's some, you know, some fundamentals about life while armed that I think it was good to be in that kind of a larger social environment to have to get some of that training. It's a little bit like going to elementary school for gun life, yeah. and you get to shoot a lot. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't an, it wasn't overwhelming though, but for people that are not used to going out and spending all day with their firearm. You, you'll get a little bit sore. Uh, some people will get blisters. Some people, uh, you'll really learn about gun grips in a consequential way because when you're just going in and shopping for a gun and you think, oh, this feels good in my hand, you go off and on your own time when not in a class, you want to shoot 50 or 100 rounds of your gun. You might feel like that's well, a lot of experience with it, but you're, when you're going through 200 rounds plus a lot of dry fire exercises uh, in this kind of a course, your hand is going to feel it. Uh, and maybe for the first time in your life, and you'll learn about, well, I really didn't like that kind of grip, or my gun really tears me up, or this was a really comfortable gun and I am very happy with the choice. Uh, and uh, so, I, to me, I, that was something I would have never contemplated had I not gotten into the environment where you're drawing a lot, going through some of that training. I guess the other part of the training that is fundamental, but a lot of people wouldn't do it on their own and might not know how to teach themselves on, the, uh, on their own, it was the basic diagnostics of malfunctions and how to clear them. Uh, you know, if you're out on your own and you haven't experienced this, or maybe someone else has been the one clearing something for you, how are you then at some point on your own going to deal with this? And if you own a firearm for the purpose of self-defense, home defense, there's not going to be someone there to clear a malfunction for you. And so, again, it's just part of this basic menu of what a responsible gun owner should know. They have a lot of experience of packaging it into a digestible, containable period of time. And I just think that they do it pretty well for a sizable audience. They do. And a lot of it for the student is they build that good foundation, but you have to take that home and, and use it and practice it and ingrain those movements. Otherwise, you know, the malfunction specifically, as long as you have those movements ingrained, it's going to work. So there's a lot. So you don't just come take the class and it's, it's done. If you want to retain this stuff, if you want to be proficient in it, you're certainly going to have to take it home and use it, which for me is, is part of the fun part too, because yes, you go, you learn, and it's done, but in reality, there's so much more to be done. So the class really doesn't end because you can take that knowledge with you, and that's, that's kind of the fun part for me. I think that's a really interesting challenge coming out of this because I think 
If you're an enthusiast about these things and you go through these classes, I think you're going to like going through these these classes and you're going to like the idea of going back. Yes. Um, I live in Idaho, you're in Utah, it's not just around the corner to get down there and back. Uh, but thinking, taking on that creative challenge of how do we then go out in our ordinary practice weekends or whenever we find the time to be able to train and do these kinds of things. I think it's achievable. Uh, it's still not going to eliminate the appetite for saying, hey, I'd kind of like to go back and do another two-day course. I'd kind of like to try the four-day course. I'd like to do skill builders and things like that. I'd like to try, what would, now that I've done the two-day handgun, what would the two-day shotgun or rifle be like? There's a lot of different things to think about and try, but maybe the more constructive thing is between now and then, how do we go out and practice this stuff just as graduates of an initial two-day course? For me and my environment, you guys know that I have plenty of open land to go out and do this stuff, so it's easy for me. But a lot of you guys that live back in other areas that don't have access to that, you can't do these stuff at the range, but you can do these dry fire practice drills, you can do these malfunction clearing drills in your home, as long as you're doing it safely, of course. But there's a lot of stuff you can do without actually firing a bullet. And initially, when I found out that we were gonna shoot 200 rounds in the course of two days, I honestly was disappointed. I wanted more trigger time. Having gone through this specific course and what it was designed for, I, I thought that round count was very appropriate. And having the dry manipulation and having the manipulation of the gun when empty, I think helped aid in my um, in my actual shooting of the gun. And there's so much that goes along with with a firearm that isn't just pulling the trigger. There's a whole different world to it that needs to be explored that I think many people do not. Steve, what would you say was your biggest takeaway from the two-day course? That's a hard question because I really felt like there were a lot of there, there were a lot of areas where I felt like I gained something. Where there are things that I would have sort of an aha moment of, you know, I hadn't really thought about that, but now that they explained it, I should have, and it seems obvious. And I just really felt like there were a lot of parts of my foundation that I didn't know I had gaps that got filled in. Uh, number one uh, would probably be the thought about how to approach the trigger pull. And uh, it, I think I'm convinced that was my major gain in accuracy and proper firearm handling uh, on the range. Uh, and but close second on that was not mastering, because I don't think I'm a master of anything on this stuff, but really getting ingrained and comfortable with the grip that they teach and basically believing in the philosophy behind the grip that they teach. Right. I think the combination of those two made me feel much more comfortable and confident in basically my range accuracy and you know when you feel more accurate you enjoy practice and shooting more and uh, so I felt like there was just experiential evidence that, th that there was a purpose for what they were doing that I could apply it and that just felt I just felt like uh, it just felt good to know that there was some initial measurable growth so I can't say there's any one thing but those kinds of things together made it definitely worth the two days of being there and the two days of going and getting back. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the, another thing that people might want to think about is we went as a group. Uh, we were able to be in the class together. Uh, we hadn't known each other before the trip, but it was nice to go with someone you were comfortable with. Uh, but just in terms of personal dynamics, what we witnessed uh, it's sort of, uh, it's something you might want to consider whether spouses should do this together. Uh, maybe you want to go as a group of friends. It's a little bit easier when you're just friends to sort of coach each other and correct each other or encourage each other. Uh, but uh, we saw a few couples that it wasn't a guarantee they were going to come out of this as a couple. They did though, but it, you know, we, we sort of wondered. 
at different times. But there's some interesting human dynamics in going through it. But you know, going through alone, you might not necessarily feel as comfortable unless you have a more outward personality that's more comfortable basically getting together with people that are getting pushed out of their comfort zone with a firearm. Some people, when they're getting pushed out of their comfort zone, get defensive, and that will get reflected onto how they treat the person that's nearest to them trying to work with them. Uh, you know, we had an easy rapport doing this stuff together, uh, and so you might want to think about when you're going through this kind of thing, who do you want to go with? Or maybe you're the kind of person that easily enters another group, you feel comfortable with your base of knowledge, and so it's not really going to matter to you who you're paired up with because they do have this approach of being student and coach. And if you're a first-timer, you might really feel very uncomfortable about why am I anybody's coach? And uh, I think they do a decent job of indoctrinating that kind of philosophy. Uh, and so it's a hurdle people can overcome, but initially people might not feel great about that idea. Uh, and uh, so to me, I, I actually felt a little bit more comfortable that after the ride down, we knew each other well enough that we had a little bit of rapport going through that coach-student swap. Yeah. Uh, and if I was doing it with a stranger, eh, it would have might have might have been at least a little bit of a warm-up period before that felt good. Right. I think that approach was interesting. Uh, again, you guys know I did the martial arts for a, for a while, and when I taught, I learned the most. So I think that approach is a very valuable one because you actually go through the motions, but then you get to step back and kind of go through them again via another person and coach them through it and then apply those same lessons to yourself. So for me, it, it was helpful in that regard. Well, when we were going through this, most of the time you were line A and I was line B. So I got to cheat a little bit by watching you go through the exercise and then go second. Uh, and you know, you know, it, it, you know that, that coaching part, in a way, might overstate what your responsibility is as a coach in that you definitely can help and coach. You're sort of there to cover some basic safety to make sure that people don't wildly turn around and muzzle people, which can happen. And uh, But, there's this this real great opportunity to be up close observing someone else go through this. You can observe the gun, you can observe what recoil really looks like, you can observe uh, handling of the gun more carefully, and it makes it easier for you to model the right mechanics of, of these things. In a way, if you're to, if you're in a way too respectful of the other person, you're not going to be up close enough to take that in. Uh, and so I thought it was uh, it was an interesting model. I I, were, I wondered whether I would have been as comfortable with a complete stranger going through it. But having gone through it, looking back, I would encourage people not to be too afraid of it. Number one. There are some interesting personalities, but all of the people on campus were pretty nice. Uh, and everyone was motivated to go there to learn. I didn't sense there were too many people who were going there to be hot shots and braggarts and whatever else. They were all going for training. Yes. And the trainers, I, we were really lucky. The, the range master that we had had an inviting charisma and personality. I thought he was accessible to people at all different levels, uh, and uh, so to me, just lots of positives. I also have no basis of comparison in the sense I haven't gone to other training courses uh, to be able to say, oh, this is the Maserati version or this is sort of the suburban version yeah. of where you go and get fire training, uh, but I thought it was... Uh, I mean, they, they did a really good job of being able to reach a diverse group. It made me feel comfortable at my level, had a good experience, measurable progress, forced to think about things I wouldn't have otherwise think or thought about, get pushed out of your comfort zone, and can't forget you get to do some fun things, even though it was too brief, in going through simulation that, you, that an average person isn't going to be able to set up in their practice area and be able to do. So, you know, in two days, 
at a pretty reasonable price, you get an awful lot. Do you mind if I interject something here? Yes. You do mind. Okay. <laughs> Never mind then. <laughs> no, I'll just say one thing um, in regards to what you were talking about uh, with, with the student coach relationship. Yeah. Um, so I do think that if you come down with somebody that you're already familiar with, it'd be an advantage. However, this is my second time down at Front Sight. Um, the first time I went down all by myself, had, didn't know anybody down there, uh, but made friends pretty quickly. And coached people that I'd never met before, was coached by people I'd never met before, and it worked out great. Uh, today, and this time, I went down, I mean, we all went down together. Right. You guys were in one class, and I was in a completely different class. So once again, I was coaching people I'd never met before and being coached by people I'd never met before. And uh, the previous time I was down there, I think I stuck with the same guy for most of the class, four days. This time, the guy I was with on the first day uh, bailed on the second day, and so I was with three or four different people the next day. So it was very much a kind of a thing where if you sort of demonstrate a little bit of friendliness and a little bit of willingness to, you know, be a good coach and, uh, and be helpful, they're going to be just as helpful back. And, and it's if you do decide to go down by yourself, or maybe you can't find somebody that can come down with you, don't make that a reason not to go. You know, just go down there, be willing to get into it, jump into it with whoever else is showing up. And there will be a few other people there that aren't there with somebody. Just pair up and have some fun and, you know, remember that everybody's there to learn. Everybody wants to enjoy themselves and get some good skills. Start with that attitude and you'll do fine. People yeah. are there to learn and to have a good time. And judging by the reactions, people, I mean, I'm sure people took various amounts of information from it, but everyone had a good time. At the end, people were happy. Throughout, people were happy. You know, there might be a few moments of frustration and trying to learn something new and take it out of that comfort zone, but I think that's a good thing, too. Overall, uh, I would recommend going down. It was a lot of fun. Being a shooter for most of my life, you no know, handguns, a little more so in my later part, but still for a good, gosh, I don't know, 15, 16, 20 years now. Uh, Taking the basic course, and I'll go into this in detail in another video, it was worth it for me. I'll just simply put it that way. Yeah, we, when we were talking about it in the class, you know, I sort of joked a little bit, but I think the analogy still applies. I mean, NBA players still practice free throws. Yes. And these fundamentals are for people at all levels. And I'm not an NBA player in regard to guns. <laughs> I don't think I'm a master in them at all. But well, just having, what I'm saying is having a gun in my hand for that many years, there was very much so information in this class that was applicable and valuable to me as a shooter. Well, the instructors kind of are NBA players when it comes to firearms. They seem to have gone through. They talk, they talk about how you're very experienced uh, students have to come through and like you had you had dealt with some challenges of things you needed to unlearn in order to try to do things their way and maybe some of those will hold and maybe some of those won't for me a little bit more of unmolded clay it was easier easier for me because I wasn't wedded to any particular philosophy I, I noticed that I had already cultivated some habits uh, whether it's how you stand or how you grip or how you present that I needed to change but those weren't deeply ingrained for me I can only imagine what it must be like for a retired military officer or a retired law enforcement officer who feels very very proficient uh, but is going through there and all of that muscle memory training and methodology get, needing to get tweaked that probably is, a, a, is an interesting challenge that yes. I won't know. Yes. Um, I have a specific stance I like, and honestly, it's built up around years of training in my martial arts. That's just what I'm used to going into, and that's what I went into, and it's not the stance they recommend. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the right one or the one you should use, 
but I really try to empty my cup, so to speak, for those familiar with that analogy, and apply what they taught. And that, that was a bit of a challenge for me, but I'll, again, I'll flesh that out in, a, in another video. Um, but I'll tell you, using what they taught, I, I shoot better. That tells you anything. Anything else you guys can think to throw in? Uh, I don't know if it, it, obviously they give you a lot of choices about a lot of things. Uh, if people are more of a beginner, uh, I would strongly recommend they consider renting rather than bringing. Uh, I would strongly recommend they consider going with a Glock or a Springfield without safeties basically to make it as simple a gun as possible to train with. Uh, and, you know, I practiced as a relatively new enthusiast with a firearm with which I had no familiarity. All of the fundamentals worked very much with a very simple gun. He ran an, an XD45 is right. what Steve was running. And that's one of the things we notice. A lot of the people that seem to not have a lot of experience with guns, those guns equipped. <coughs> excuse me. Those guns equipped with safeties. Uh, it, with all the information coming in, it did make a difference in how they manipulated the gun. I've heard that mentioned a lot in the past, but typically the shooters I go out with are people who have been around guns quite a bit. And having experienced this, that was an added step that created confusion. Uh, it created time, increased time, and in, in what they needed to do. So I would, I would support that and say I would go with a gun that was very simple to operate, Glock, XD, something of that nature that didn't have a lot of bells and whistles, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's not it, you know they they try to make clear it's not they're not trying to push a brand uh, everyone's got opinions about brands whether you have these things or not but it distracts away from the fundamentals they're trying to teach and if, especially if you're relatively new uh, you're you're going to be in a real information overload environment and so eliminating some of those variables in order to absorb these fundamentals you can go back and add on those extra steps that's still that's still part of the training you can do yourself or go back and take another class with another gun but I have a couple of different kinds of guns some have some of these bells and whistles uh, I was tempted to bring my 1911 to go and to do the course with that I was very very happy that I didn't so that I could focus on those other things and eliminate some of those unnecessary variables I look forward to someday going back with it to add in that extra wrinkle when I'm ready to add in the ability to think about those extra steps. That's an interesting point. That's a good point. Alright guys, I think we'll wrap it up. I'm hoping the audio is okay on this. We're driving, so we'll have to see it when I get it on the computer. But Steve, the late boy scout, headed down to front site for some training. It was a lot of fun. As always guys, thanks for watching.